Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Becca and this is my channel where I talk about all the houseplant things. Today I'm going to be doing a continuation of a previous video that I made seven months ago, which was plant debates. In this video, I'm going to be talking about common plant debates circling around right now in the plant community and tell you my opinion on them. I will link down below the first episode because I talked about a lot of really, really common plant debates. When I asked you guys for topics to discuss in this video, I got a lot of repeats from the last video, so if you are curious on some of those debates, I will link that down below. But today we have new debates, so I asked you guys on Instagram, I put up an Instagram story question, so if you're not following me on Instagram, you should definitely head over there and follow me so that you can, I don't know, participate in my videos whenever I want to do something like this because I find these videos very fun to make and I hope that you enjoy watching them. Let's just get started. The first debate is moss poles versus twine or jute poles. And also I'm gonna like add in here maybe a cocoa choir pole because those are also very popular. I would have to say that I am the biggest fan of moss poles and I have a lot of different kinds of moss poles that I like to make. I do have currently a cocoa choir pole and it just, it's kind of ugly. I don't really like it that much. Like the overlap I think is really ugly. Um, there's just like not a lot of like seamlessness in the cocoa choir. And then the downside of moss poles is that the moss dries out so fast. So you need to constantly keep them moist. Oh, which is a really hard debate, but I guess if anything, I would have to say moss poles because I enjoy those the most. I think that my plants also enjoy those the most and I've seen the most interaction with the aerial roots and the pole with a moss pole, never with a cocoa pole or a jute pole. So that is my opinion on that one. Commercial soil mixes or custom soil mixes. I'm gonna have to say custom soil mixes because there is not currently a product out there that I would feel comfortable using directly on my house plant. I talked about maybe two videos ago, a really amazing cactus and succulent soil. That is the first soil, in all honesty, that I have used directly on my plants and not made any amendments at all. And that is by Tanks Green Stuff. I'll have them linked down below as well. Other than that, I have never found a soil that I'm perfectly content using all my plants directly. And I'm gonna have a self plug moment, but I am working on a project with Tanks Green Stuff to find a solution for a houseplant mix that could be used right away. We will be rolling this out like pretty soon in the next couple of months. I. I think, yeah, I am allowed to talk about it. So you can look forward to that because I know that mixing our own soil mixtures is really difficult, but actually finding a soil mixture on the shelves or online that I would feel comfortable using on my plants directly is so rare. Like I said, it's only happened once before. As far as this question goes right now, I would say custom soil mixtures until we make one with Tanks Green stuff. <laughs> buying baby plants or buying mature plants. I'm really torn on this because a couple of months ago, I probably would have said buying baby plants. And I guess it just depends on the type of plant that you're buying. I don't think that I would buy a baby pothos just because they're not that expensive to begin with. And I think I'd prefer to have a really big majestic one if I was to buy a pothos again. Yeah, if it's a really expensive or like a rare plant, I would definitely opt for a baby plant because those are a lot more affordable. So I guess it just depends on the type of plant that I'm looking for. If it's really common, if it's not, or like what the running price is at that time. I think that will really change the price that I would be willing to pay. Waiting for a cutting to callus or putting it straight into the water or substrate. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I usually just put them straight into water <laughs> because Anytime I have left the cutting to callus, I have forgotten about it. And then the leaves are like really dehydrated and it's just not a good situation. So I tend to put them straight into water so that I don't forget about it. I've never had any issues of rotting. You know, a lot of the reason that people tell you to let it callus a little bit is because if the stem is like freshly cut, it will absorb a lot of water or something like that, or it can just like rot a lot easier. Uh, that's really unsciency of a explanation of that, but the only plant that I let callus over when I make a cut of it is cactus or succulents because I just trust them to lay out completely severed from the plant for a lot longer than like a tropical plant, for example. Cactus can seriously like just lay on the floor with nothing, like no soil, no water for weeks and like totally be fine when you do end up planting them. So with that being said, cactus, yes, tropicals, no. <laughs> Foliage or blooms? I'm definitely, definitely more of a foliage person. Like obviously all of my houseplants are known for their foliage, 
but getting blooms on my Hoyas has been really incredible, but that's probably the only plant that I would say I like really am here for the blooms. You know, everything else is just kind of meh. It doesn't really matter to me if it blooms or not. Although my Anthurium clarinervium is blooming right now and I'm going to cut off the flower because it's putting out pollen right now so that I can pollinate another flower later and maybe get seeds. I'm so excited to do that, but I guess like flowers are exciting, but it's more rare. So I guess I'm definitely more of a collector for foliage because that's just like so much prettier to me. Liquid or powder fertilizer. And I also saw like chemical versus organic fertilizer. To be honest with you, it's not something that I have thought about a ton. Like in my mind, fertilizer is fertilizer. And then I started using an actual like powder organic fertilizer from Tank Screen Stuff, like I mentioned in that previous video and it's really really cool because I think that that kind of fertilizer helps with the soil health long term like a lot better than a liquid non-organic fertilizer would I mean I was using a liquid non-organic fertilizer for basically the duration of my plant parenthood it was by miracle Grow. it was just like a general fertilizer and I still have it obviously because it's like a huge bottle it's a concentrate but when I started using a more powder organic fertilizer it's basically like compost and worm castings and just like a bunch of stuff like that I saw more results with that and I just feel like that will be better for the soil in the long run okay the best wind window i think yeah i don't even have to think about this actually east windows are the best windows in the whole world you can't even tell me that you disagree east windows are my favorite because they bring in so much bright light like so so much bright light especially where i live especially in the summer because my full east windows do get southern exposure too depending on like where the plant is in the windowsill letting plants grow freely or training them definitely training them if i let my plants go freely there would not be space for me in this home because basically just like the sheer amount of plants that I have and the size of my plants I would say that I have a good number of large plants I live here Daniel lives here Leo lives here and we got to be careful to not be running into plants all the time and even when I keep my plants contained and like trained upwards they still find a way Daniel and Leo they still find a way to knock them over and it just it happens all the time so I definitely train my plants mostly for that reason alone and also I mean I think that the growth is just a lot more natural to what it would look like in its natural habitat like monsteras and other epiphytes like they grow up and so it's just natural for them to climb onto things buying plants you know will not do well because you love them okay listen I don't know who needs to hear this stop doing that <laughs> because you're really just setting yourself up and the plant up for failure and failure sucks and it really drives a lot of people away from things like I talked about this in my green thumbs video like when you fail at something your first instinct is to just quit because well you, you weren't that good at it anyway it doesn't matter all of these things and so when you are constantly buying plants that you know in your head and your heart that are not going to do well in your home you end up in a cycle of killing plants, buying it, killing it, buying it. It's just like really painful. And if there's a plant that you just are not good at, take that and just like live with it until you have different conditions or you have more knowledge. Things can change for sure. It's not like a, we're not in a fixed mindset. We can be in a growth mindset in this situation, but you have to kind of understand when a plant is just like not driving with you. Some plants really are just meant to be admired in the garden center. Take that with what you will. There are definitely plants like ferns and calathea that I visit and I don't bring home and I can enjoy them, but I don't have to worry about them. It's kind of like you're the aunt, like you're the fun aunt, you know, your sister had all these bratty kids and you get to hang out with them when they're fun and then she gets to take them home when they like <laughs> themselves. <laughs> Repotting new plants immediately or waiting? Okay, listen, I think it really depends on what condition the plant is currently in. Hopefully you have brought home a healthy plant, but sometimes soil from the nursery is kind of strange. I don't really know exactly why, but oftentimes it is strictly peat moss or like majority peat moss. I don't think that plants would really enjoy that long term. I mean, if the soil is good, I will keep it in the soil for up to a couple of months, but if it's bad soil, I will probably repot it in like a day or two and always keep it separated from other plants. Like don't let new plants touch your current plants because 
One of the biggest ways that pests make their way into your home is by new plants coming in. So we, we don't always see the pests either. Sometimes they're in a different stage of life where they're not visible yet. So definitely monitor that and make sure that your plant is healthy before you bring it home. And number two, check the soil when you bring it home to decide if you need to repot it or not. Toxic plants when you have pets. Okay, so this is something that I never had to consider really until we brought Leo home. I did live with a cat in my previous home with my old roommate, but her cat really was not interested in my plants at all, besides the spider plant. She loved to eat the spider plant, which was not toxic, so non-toxic. When you have pets, it's very important to at least be aware of your plants that are toxic. So for me, that's like 95% of my plants. I don't really have a ton of non-toxic plants, but because I have a dog, it's not really that big of a concern for me because in general, dogs are not really interested in your plants. When you start going over to like cats and bunnies and I don't know what other animals people have that could eat their plants, but those pets, if you have them, you need to be very aware of this. It doesn't mean that you can't have those plants. It just means that you need to be aware <laughs> and maybe put them in places where your animal, your cat or your bunny is not going because truly like some damage can definitely happen so i am personally okay with having toxic plants with a pet because my pet is not interested in plants even if i had a cat who was interested in plants i'd still probably have toxic plants but i would keep them away and like train the cat not to do that i don't even know how you would do that i've never had a cat of my own so no clue really but there are ways i think you can like scare them and that seems mean, but anyway. Okay, remove soil slash disturb roots when repotting or leave it alone. I've been thinking about this one for a while because I think that I've done both. When I'm mindlessly repotting, sometimes I will loosen the soil and sometimes I won't. I would say a majority of the time actually I loosen the soil because that's just been like drained in my brain from a very young age, like repotting flowers and stuff with my mom. She always told me to like make sure that you just like loosen up the root ball. And with flowers and things like that, their roots are so much more delicate and it's so much easier to pull apart. So maybe we don't think about it as much, but when it comes to house plants, the roots are often tuberous or thick and we're nervous to disturb them. But the the truth is I have never had a plant suffer from me disturbing the roots and loosening it up a little bit. It's basically just letting the plant know, hey, you can explore this new home. You can check things out. You don't have to worry. You are welcome here. <laughs> and when you don't loosen the roots, I don't think that it's detrimental to the plant. I just think that it'll take longer for it to get acquainted with its new home because those roots have to like loosen on their own, which it will happen. But it might just take a little bit longer and the faster your roots can get acclimated the faster you're going to start seeing new growth and just like improvements on the top of the plant okay i'm bringing this one up again i talked about this in the previous video but i have a different opinion now because i've experienced some things so organic or harsh pesticides so i think this is really just like organic or chemical pesticides so after experiencing spider mites like i have and am continuing to experience spider mites because it's one of those things that just like never fully goes away I am fully on the chemical train because I have seen how quickly it works and how effectively it works honestly since I started using a chemical um, I use eight that is like my tried and true I have not seen as many breakouts as I did previously and when I use eight I see them gone for like much 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 longer and I feel like I finally have the infestation under control and I, I don't know if that's necessarily because of the pesticide I'm using or because I'm just more aware now. Okay, we're almost done here. Trailing or climbing plants. So I definitely am more of a climbing plants person now. And what I'm realizing is a lot of trailing plants can be trained to be climbing plants. And I am here for it. Like I love it so much. I think it's so, so beautiful to see plants growing huge, huge leaves, like so much faster than they would if they were trailing. In this nursery, that I visited I saw a bunch of plants growing on big poles like it was like wood stakes actually and it was so cool to see the plants and all their roots like digging in I saw a Brazil a philodendron Brazil with leaves like this big and I have never seen that before okay we're gonna end it on a controversial note perhaps and that is what sticks yay or nay seems to be a hot topic lately given the elbow craze 
wet sticks. Okay, so if you're unfamiliar with what a wet stick is, it's basically a stick, like no leaves, with a node or two on it, and it's usually like an Alba Monstera or another prized plant. And basically what this is, is people are selling you for probably hundreds of dollars a 50% chance of you actually having this plant and when it does actually grow it will be very 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 juvenile Obviously because it is growing strictly from the stem. I think the success rate for wet sticks is Like I said 50% earlier, but I honestly think it might be even lower than that like you really have to be very patient and diligent and like know how to propagate a plant really well in order for this to be successful i'm not saying that you wouldn't have success otherwise it's just it's not as likely if you want to sell wet sticks like that's your thing but i think that it's wrong to charge hundreds of hundreds of dollars for it like for a 50 percent or less chance of it actually turning into a plant with that i mean we get the price gouging conversation again which i want to save for another time if there are people who will buy at that price there are going to be people who will continue to sell at that price so when there's a demand there will be a supply uh, the supply will be met or no no the demand will be met wet sticks for like 50 bucks sure wet sticks for three four hundred dollars no that's a big no for me <laughs> so i don't know that's my opinion on that i think that the rare plant market is full of people who are just trying to make a quick buck and they have found a way to do so like they were successful so anyway that's an entirely other conversation and i really want to save that for another time but i wanted to answer that question because i felt it was the most controversial there's a lot of elitists in the plant community who think that they're better than others because they started before other people they have more expensive plants they have this they have that whatever it may be i just want to say that a plant elitist is no friend of mine because this hobby is for everyone and I'm not here trying to make a quick buck like this is something that is actually a part of my life and you can very easily tell when someone is just trying to make a quick buck um, just open your eyes you know not everybody in the plant community is nice and here for like good reasons just be aware you know I talked about this in stories a couple weeks ago but especially with plant swaps and things like that just be very careful about who you share personal details with, especially your address. You never know. I think that there's been a lot of negative people infiltrating the plant community as it's getting bigger. So just be careful. Just be careful out there, you guys, all right? And know who your friends are and stick with them, okay? <laughs> all right, you guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed, despite the sour note at the end. I hope that you enjoy the plant debates. If you want to answer one or multiple of these plant debates in your opinion, let me know down in the comments below. And I should say, if you are a YouTuber and you want to answer any of these plant debates in a video, we could totally turn this into a tag video. Just tag me in your video, say, hey, this tag was started by Becca De La Plants, and I'm going to do the plant debates tag. You can take questions from this video or the previous video and just like have at it, all right? So thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would like to support De La Plants on a monthly basis for extra perks and fun, go ahead and check out the join button below this video. Make sure that you're subscribed if you're not. And if you want to hang out on a daily basis, go ahead and check out my Instagram account, De La Plants. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. I will see you in the next video. Bye.